think happened that it died there. I think we raised the market level so fast that it became everyone's opinion that it's on its way again. And I'm not sure that you really believed yet that you'd done it yourself. I really don't believe you did. I think you thought that it had just taken off and it was going to do it anyway. So we become uncontractable. If it had come up $7 in 30 days, who in the world would want to sell now? You know, it may come up $7 in the next 30 days. So we went 10 days, a week and a half, with no sales whatsoever as far as forward contracting. And that's all it took. And we went right back down to where we'd started from. Then you start getting into the fall season and everybody starts getting nervous, you know. We've got to get them gone, we've got to get them gone, so we're right back into what Dick was talking about. We're into liquidation selling. And we have no advantages in liquidation selling. I'm not saying that our negotiators cannot negotiate out a better price for you than you would have got in the local barn because we are nationwide. But the thing I'm saying is you have taken the bargaining power really away from them. See, the other thing that I'm sure is hard to understand when you're in one area in Montana, one area in Missouri, one area in Kentucky, is that when you decide that you've got to go tomorrow or this week with your calves, See, what you don't realize from that area is that 385 other collection points have decided that they ought to do the same thing. And then it's a little hard for you to understand why four negotiators sitting there can't get all of your cattle sold on the same day or in the same week. So you see what kind of a position that you're putting them in. So what we've got to do is rely more on the forward contracts. There's nothing wrong with block selling. There's nothing wrong with collection point runs. And there's nothing wrong with direct ships. That's some of the options that we have that we'll get into here a little bit later. But it does not do what the organization was set out to do. Okay, there's two years. Okay, both of those were a coincidence. Then let's back up and let's go back to like 1963. You see the market was gyrating along and doing not much of anything from 1963 until 1968. There's some ups and downs in the market, sure. But it had already sought a level and that was where the market was. So what happened in 1968 that made this change? The National Farmers set up a feeder cattle program in 1968 and started blocking calves in the state of Montana. And the idea that the ranchers were coming in to the national farmers and were building a block of production, shook the buyers, and everybody hit the road. I'm not saying that we sold cattle at that top price and that's what made this graph what it is. It's the idea that you people in the country were putting together volume that your local buyers probably were not going to get. So they had to get aggressive, didn't they? Why weren't they aggressive before? Because they didn't have to be. They operate on the same basis of a packer does. You know, a packer doesn't really care whether cattle are a dollar a hundred or whether they're ten cents a hundred. 
as long as he gets his out of the middle because that's his business and that's all he's concerned with. And that's all that your local buyer is concerned with. He wants to get his part out of the middle so he can make his living. And we've got to be concerned enough that we can get our part so we can make our living. So consequently, it doesn't matter whether you make a sale. The idea is that you've got the block. And that will start your market raising. Okay, we went through and the people seen that it worked. And from 1968 until 1972 and three, the feeder market raised probably 30 to 40 bucks a hundred because you people put blocks together and forward contracted and set floor prices and move cattle as an organization. Every time nothing happened, the market dropped. Every time NFO got in the market, it raised. I think probably in 1972, when the market started climbing somewhat by itself, there was a feeling that we were over the top. We were over the hill on the thing. There was going to be no more problems in the cattle industry. Everybody could make a profit. Consequently, in 1973, what happened? I went to some meetings in Colorado. I went to some meetings in Missouri. I was at some meetings in the Dakotas. One meeting I was at in Colorado, some fellow stood up and hung a dollar bill on the ceiling and said, that's where it's going. And the crowd said no to a 85 cent contract and walked out of the room. And that was in 1973. And they left. And before the fall was over, they took 40 cents for a lot of those calves. Why? Because there's no power in doing it alone. It's got to be done together and it's got to be done as blocks. It's not to say that you're not going to have any success if you don't work the national program and one huge block out of the whole country. Let me show you what I mean. What does this remind you of? Being a cattleman all my life, it remind me of a feedlot. I guess just because it looked like one large pen. Then I broke that down, and it really reminds me a little bit more of a feedlot now because there's four pens, and I can see them full of cattle standing out here somewhere on feed. And I break that down a little bit more. And there is a typical feedlot made up of several pens. And they're all full of cattle. How does a feedlot go about selling these cattle? See, they don't sell the cattle out of their one pen at a time. Did you know a big commercial lot normally does not sell the cattle out of their one pen at a time? Why? Because if they sell five or ten pens at a time, you've got more bargaining power. It's exactly like we operate in NFO. Okay, this isn't a feedlot. This is the state of South Dakota. It's sitting out there all by itself and up here in one little corner We've got somebody with a hundred head of calves. Doesn't really amount to much, does it? He, he called them in individually to the office by himself and said, I've got a hundred head of calves, I want to sell them. That's an awful big area to have some guy setting up in some corner of it with a hundred head of cattle. 
So you break that down and you get somebody who will be responsible for working the program in four different areas of that, split it up equally. And each one of those guys finds a man with a hundred head of cattle or puts together a hundred head of cattle. You've now got 400 head to talk about and you've got a little bit more to bargain with, haven't you? But they're still quite a ways apart and it still really isn't what you need to affect and move the market. So you break that down and you get somebody in every county or at every collection point who will take on just a little bit of responsibility and get someone to help him. And each one of those areas puts together a hundred head of cattle. And then you've got something to talk about. So really it's no different than what we were talking about it being a feedlot. They've been in the business for years and they understand that they can get more buyers and can get them to give more money if they've got a larger concentration of cattle to be looked at, to be seen. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't necessarily mean that when you get this put together that those cattle would all be sold as one entire block. But what it does, it gives you the bargaining power and it takes it away from somebody who would have liked to have them. And consequently, he's got to give more money to get them out of his area. So what happens when the local dealer then has to give more money and let's say he's shipping cattle back to one of the same areas that the national farmers are to some of their customers. If we're getting 72 for our calves, the local dealer suddenly has got to give more for them out there than we are in order to get them, then he's going to have to start selling them back here for 73, isn't he? In order to buy them away from you and in order to get them back here, he's going to have to sell them for a little more money. So when he starts asking 73, then you go to the same guys in the same area and you can get the same kind of money. And consequently, if he's going to stay in business out there buying the cattle from you, he's going to have to give more again. And it's a never ending stair step until you reach your cost of production plus a profit. Now the problem you get into when you get to that plateau is we never know when to quit, do we? You know, we get a dollar and that's not enough. And so we get a dollar five and that's not enough and we keep pushing it until we break our market. What's got to happen is you have got to forward contract and hold and stabilize the market once you've reached your cost of production plus a profit. You don't keep pushing it up. You contract three months down the road, six months down the road, a year down the road, and you keep moving it. And you keep contracting out further ahead, and at the time that it becomes very visible that that's no more enough of a profit, then you raise your market level again. But you don't keep continually pushing it higher. It doesn't work that way. So what do we have to do? We have to keep the farmer or the rancher and the feeder working together. Just as we have to strive with our employees, with our negotiators, to keep them working together. You know, the worst thing that can happen is the feeders say, well, all those guys, you know, I don't care about them. I got to worry about myself or the ranchers out here saying, well, I don't care, care about them. I've got to worry about myself because when either one gets greatly out of balance, both are in trouble. If they take a shellacking on the cattle they fed, then chances are you're going to take a shellacking on the cattle you're raising the next year because they want to get even. And this is the importance of stabilizing a market 
out far enough ahead to stop the fluctuations. I'll guarantee you on the graph I just showed you that the market level was steadier before we got into forward contracting cattle. You know why it was steadier? It was also one heck of a lot lower, but it was steadier because there was nothing disrupting the old marketing system. The buyers had it their way, they worked together, and there was no problems. But all at once, here comes along a bunch of rubes and, you know, and we foul it all up for them. But the reason it is not as steady as it was then is because we won't forward contract every year, will we? We get it up to where we want it and we become uncontractable and we do nothing. We're all satisfied because even I can go with my few head of calves and sell them anywhere and still get a profit, can't I? So why should I do anything? Why should I give any of that away to anybody to move them for me? So then we drop the ball and it always overreacts both ways. The market will overreact either way. When it starts to move, why does it? Because we force it to. If it starts up, we won't sell. We start our own little holding actions and we force it all the way to the top. And then it starts to break and everybody's got a little hope, well, it'll come back again. But if in a couple of weeks it doesn't, it just keeps going a little bit lower, what do we do? Then we all go before it gets to the bottom and before we can get there, it is at the bottom. So that's where a little bit of teamwork, a little bit of inventory, a little bit of effort and forward contracting will sure pay off in the long run. It'll stop the gyrations that we have made in the market. You know, there's nothing wrong with where we've taken the market to it's the fact that we have trouble working together enough to keep it there. So that's what we've got to do. Let me give you a little of an example here of what can happen or what may be happening to the production that you may be running outside of the organization. I was talking about what you do to the buyers and what you cause to happen when you forward contract. You know, this is probably a little bit too extreme. I realize that. There are cattle that go through this very system that you're looking at. There are cattle that go through any part of that system that you're looking at right there. I have had order buyers that got hung up with a set of cattle call into the office and want to know if we could sell them and find out that they come from one of the members somewhere in the country. And they'd been through four hands before he got them. So what do we do to get our share of what all these guys are getting? All these guys may not have made a profit on these cattle, but they all intended to, didn't they? It's all built into the system that they've got to have something for their time and effort. So National Farmers Organization come along and we cut everything out of the middle except for us, didn't we? Through forward contracts, through block sales, we went directly from the producer to the feeder, to the backgrounder, to whoever. Now it's like I tell the new boys that we run into and that we sign up, you know, we're getting a lot of bigger ranchers every year. And they all say, well, you know, I'd rather have 
$68 in my pocket for these calves and not worry about your checkoff. You know, I don't want to pay that. Well, you know, it's no problem to me because he's never sold them cattle to a buyer that hasn't had something made on the cattle. So the pat answer to that, folks, is fine. You know, if that's the way you want to move the cattle, that's fine. You're turning me in to a dealer, to an order buyer. You know, you're not letting me work for you. I have a set fee for moving your calves. If that's not suitable to you to take it, then I'll pay you a flat dollar value. And anything I can mark them up, I will and will keep. But that's not what the organization set up for. We have a checkoff and marketing expense figure set so you know where we're at. But if that's not the way they want to operate, that can be changed. And that usually brings them around to agree that the checkoff probably isn't too bad after all. You know, these guys can sit around and tell me all day what the guy made on their particular set of cattle when they went the other way, but until they show me his paperwork, I don't necessarily believe them. So then what we try to do in the National Farmers Organization is watch throughout the country for your low-priced area to develop. Because every year, for some reason, somebody's too dry and has to move a lot of cattle, or somebody's too wet, or something's going on, but somebody's got a fire sale going on somewhere. Sometime every year. You know what happens when you have a fire sale? All the buyers go running in there, and they buy the cattle as cheap as they can, and they send them to the most high-priced area they can find, and they make themselves a good little chunk of money. It's only business. So what has to be done is we have to go to that area, and we have to know where the high-priced area is and what the guys will pay, and we have to buy the cattle as high as we can. And that immediately just blows everything again for everybody who is running into the area, buy them as cheap as they can. You know, I believe that this has been the hardest thing that I've had to explain to the new guys that I put to work for me, especially some of them who's come out of the industry, which it's very necessary that we have some of those kind of people. But that's been the hardest thing to explain to them why on earth we'd want to run into an area where you could buy cattle for 64 cents. Why would you want to go in there and give them 67, you know? But that's what has to be done because you let a low-priced area develop, and it happened to us last year, and we didn't get it stopped. It started in the state of North Dakota, and before it ended, it was all over the United States, and we all suffered from it. So those places have got to be found, and we've got to do something about them to stop the market from breaking all over. As you move them out of there, it affects the local buyers. They've got to become competitive to get the cattle, and their margin is already there. They don't have to worry about not making anything. It just squeezes the margin down on them and brings the low-priced area back up to an even level with the high-priced areas. Freight, of course, has to be included on all that. So what we're talking about in forward contracting, then, is stabilizing the market prices over a long period of time. This particular graph here would be talking more like calves that had been bought and were contracted for delivery as yearlings. It can work exactly the other way, and you can contract calves in December, January, for the following October, November, or December delivery. 
But what it does, it sets a floor for the market in that area. If five guys on this side of this room had sold their cattle right here today for $70, how many of you guys over here on this side being that close to them would sell yours for 65 None of you if you knew it, would you? Because that's not the market. It's too cheap. And that's exactly what you do with forward contracting. You set a floor on the market. And if you'll start it in time and if you'll work it right, and the guys aren't all scared yet and ready to do a lot of liquidation selling, then you'll automatically raise the price because we all know in this room that these guys on this side of the room are smarter than you guys. And you got 70, so these guys are going to ask 71, aren't they? Or maybe two. Because they all know their cattle are better and they can come nearer getting it than you can. So they get 72, and the other half of you on this side that hasn't sold yet has got to be better than these guys over here. So you're going to ask a buck more for yours. And that's exactly what you do. It's that simple. It gradually works the market up until you get where you need to be. But you've got to start early, you know. You can't sign them up 30 days before the snow flies and believe everything's going to be all right, you know, because it's not. You do not have any time to affect the market. We were pretty fortunate this year, and sometime after the 1st of August, we did manage to get some pretty decent sales made on some feeder cattle and kind of continually hold this market, but that's kind of a rare coincidence. I want to ask you one question. Can anybody give me an answer to why anybody sitting back here in the Corn Belt in the month of May or June would even want to consider forward contracting a calf out of the West when he knows in his own mind that if he'll just sit there and wait until the snow starts flying, he'll buy it five, ten bucks a hundred cheaper. You know, there's only one reason that I know of, and that's if the guy can buy it right and can lock it in for a profit, then he can go ahead and figure his cost, his feed bills, and whatever. And he can then know exactly where he's at and whether he's going to make a profit or not. That's the only good reason, see. But you get it started and you get the ball rolling and you find four or five guys that will do that for that reason. And then it's just like when you start your little holding actions. The other buyers see him buying, and he starts thinking, you know, a little bit about, well, one of these days I probably should buy me some. And that mushrooms also. But that's what has to be done. And, you know, really, if you guys will spend a little time thinking about this thing, that's the only reason there is why a guy would do that. And I'm a little bit afraid that if he stopped and used his head a little bit, he wouldn't do that. You know, he'd go ahead and lock his stuff in and wait anyway. So it's something that we need all the help we can with, folks. And it's, you know, I'm not standing up here trying to tell you that every hoof that's blocked is going to be sold exactly like you want it or when you want it or at all. All I'm telling you is if you will do it and give us the shot at them, it'll raise your market level. You know, if you knew of a feeder cattle program out here in the country somewhere that offered you trust-protected payments, transit insurance until the cattle leave your possession and are weighed, your own employee doing the sorting, grading, and weighing of your cattle, a sales force with a knowledge of the industry that know where the cattle need to go and what kind of cattle go where, fair weighing conditions, and an opportunity to forward contract 
and make your own markets, wouldn't you ship through something like that? That's the National Farmers Organization's feeder cattle program. And it'll work if you will work it and make it work. You know, we've got to get back to working this on a county level. We have got to have interested people all over the country. We can do so much with full-time employees, and that's all. I'd like to be able to afford to have one in or four in every state at a minimum so everybody would be covered, but that's impossible. Right at the present time, I don't even have one in every state. Some states are having to share a full-time employee to do the sorting and grading. What do we need to do in 1983? We need to start our teams earlier blocking production. We need to make some sales earlier than we made this year. You know, it doesn't hurt anybody if you'll break it down to a certain specification and say, this is the kind of a load that we need out of your collection point, and I don't care if you've got 100 owners with one calf apiece on it, just so they fit the contract. And you can do just exactly what you've seen on that other graph, what you've seen happening. You can raise the market level simply by selling one head of your own with a hundred of your neighbors. Out of each collection point in an area turns into be a lot of calves when it's all said and done. And it's certainly enough to sure affect the market. And that's all it takes. And then if that doesn't get us the results that we need, we can still come back and do it again. But the thing this year that's going to change as far as I'm concerned in the maximum of what we've been doing is every calf that's signed on a contract for sale, and I may have to send 40 guys to one state, but they're all going to be seen by one of my representatives, every hoof, one way or the other. And then if the cattle that come into the collection point at delivery time are not what my guys seen, they're going to go back home. But that's the way it's going to happen this year. Somebody is going to see every hoof that's down before we break up from this convention, I need to meet with the people from Montana, with the people from South Dakota, with the people from North Dakota, with the people from Colorado. I need to know what the perfect time is or the best time possible to have my crews in each one of your areas, possibly while the cows, I prefer to have it while the cows are still up, most of the calves on the ground, and before they're turned out. But I need to know that, and I need to work with a lot of you guys on that because that's when I want my team in your area when most of the calves are on the ground but just before the cows are turned out. That's what I need to know because that's when I want my crews into the area. You see, we've had one of those types of years where it didn't matter what you sent to the guy when you sent him his contract cattle, he didn't like them. And it was mainly because the little bottom line down here where it says 500 pounds at read anywhere from 72 to $75. And when he was taking delivery, he could have bought them for 65 to 67. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with the cattle, but you see, when you hit a year like this, I tell you, I can't argue with anybody if you go out here and you look at a set of cattle and here's 80 head of 
black calves with white spots here and there and their scimitar crosses, and you can tell it by looking at them. And there's 20 more head right on them coming out of the same herd, but they're all black. That can happen any time. But this year, the buyer would have said, well, you sent me 20 Angus, and I've got to send some guy 300 miles in a car to look at him and settle him down. So what I've got to do for next year is I've got to have my man look at them cattle, and he's going to put a color description on your contract. And if your cattle are all Simital Cross, that's great, or are all Charlotte Cross or whatever. But the main thing I want to know is that they're Montana crossbreds, and when we sell them to him, we can tell him at that time that there's a percentage of the calves that's going to be straight black. There's a percentage of the calves that's going to be straight Herefords. But this is what they look like. And then you've got no problems. You know, it's no big problem, I guess. It just takes your money and my money to have to send a guy out to look at every set of cattle you deliver in order to get them to stick. It's not been that big of a problem, but it is, it's costly. And if we've got the description in advance, we can stop it. I think the other meetings are breaking up, so I think I'd better close this off here and let you go. I had several other things that I would have liked to spend a few minutes going through, but we've pretty well, I think, covered forward contracting, which I am most interested in. And we have pretty well, I think, covered the inventory and really what we need to do to make the program work right for us. You know, it's really so simple, and I guess if you work with it about so long, it, it gets to be a little hard for us to understand, and I'm sure we get a little short sometimes with a lot of people because it's just hard to understand what I've showed you here today, why it's not a lot easier for everybody to see how that works. But you know, again, we're talking about the same situation when I said it's hard for you to understand why it's got to be nationwide and what we can see happening down here and up here and over here that changes the market for everyone. And it becomes a little hard occasionally for us to be able to sit in there and see the side that the producer sitting out here is looking at also. That's why it's so important that we get it broke down to county and be able to work together. We'll start another meeting here at 11. There is a collection point meeting, and I don't have the room number. I filed up again as normal. 219. Okay, right down the hall this way. The fat cattle meeting is next door, and the hog meeting is also off to your left as you go out the door. I thank you all for attending. Anything any you need to meet with me or anything you want to talk about uh, before we leave here, I should be pretty well free all day tomorrow. I thank you all for coming.